So my application process, well, I think, I mean, I, 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 uh, I'm not um, a graduate entry. I, I just went straight from uh, sixth form into uh, medicine. Um, so I applied to four different universities. I got three different offers. Um, so I applied to UCL, uh, Birmingham, Oxford and Bristol. And uh, they, I had interviews from all of them and then but i got offers from three and the the thing that i think was helpful for me was the fact that i was from a widely participation group so there was a lot of um when i so every university had or every area if you're linked to a university hat should have some sort of widely participation society um, so for me, the because I was in London, I was very fortunate. There was Imperial College, there was UCL, there's Kings, and there's Queen Mary as well. Queen Mary didn't do so much. Well, the one I I, I wasn't aware of Queen Mary ones. I was very aware of uh, UCL ones that were, they were doing about um, and Imperial ones they were doing. And essentially, what these programs were for winding participation were um, either giving you mentorship. Um, and some of them also did like mock UCATs, uh, mock BMATs, which were quite useful for the whole application process. Um, and even there was some interview practice. So a lot of these interview practice, um, a lot there are a lot of companies out there that charge for it. Um, yeah. So if you're quite yeah. affluent or have that sort of fun, means to fund it, you have tutors and things like that to help you. And that's fine if you can afford it. But if you can't, you're kind of screwed because. Um, you just don't have the access to those resources. Uh, that does cause an unfair advantage to them, but the whining participation uh, groups uh, definitely um, help balance that out because there's m now more and more free resources out there. Um, so I think those those are the things that I use. I did, and having that mentorship really really helped me sort of like set myself apart from other people to uh, apply into med school. Yeah, and the main reason I wanted to speak with you specifically is because you're so vocal in the respect of your journey through medical school and I guess what your opinions are on going through medical school. I feel like you know, some of the information that you provide is is really useful and I'd recommend anybody to go and uh, check that out. So I guess you, you probably, you, are, you have covered that in your on your Instagram, but my first question would be, like, why medicine? What, what made you choose medicine? So, initially, <laughs> my real reason for medicine was it was a, it was a vendetta against uh, the NHS. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was, uh, it was uh, um, I sort of, I, I don't know why, it was just, you know when sometimes there's something that sticks into your head and you just can't, you just want to like prove someone wrong. So, for me, it was... Uh, I wanted to prove that I could be better than them kind of thing. Like, I just felt like when I was having the care that I had, um, sometimes it felt like it, w it was kind of poor and it wasn't great. Um, but I, that was my whole drive. I was like, you know, I, I want to do better. You know, this is, I don't, I don't want to have been treated like the way I got treated. I want to do better. And then now, like, going through med school, um, I kind of realized it wasn't really their fault. It was sort of the system's fault. It was crushing people. And they, as much as someone wants to be kind and gentle and be advocating for you, it's great and all to do that, but there's a crushing system in the NHS where they can't do that. So that was the biggest motivation for me was like, I wanted to prove some, like, you know, I could do better. Um, although that's not probably what I said in the interview. Um, <laughs> but, that, but that was my real... Like reason behind doing medicine but the other thing is as I went through medicine I, I just loved it more and more I mean I was stuck between before when I first applied I was stuck between either applying for chemistry or applying for medicine and I was like okay let me let me think about it long term can I see myself being in the labs all the time and I was thinking sort of but I had some lab experience and I did love it and I had lab experience at UCL where I did some uh, research on epilepsy uh, and it was nice it was good but it, it, it just 
it didn't feel right to me. It just felt like it's nice, but it, it's not me. And I hated GP. I was like, ah, oh, man, but it doctored me in GP. I was like, this is not for me. It's like, it's just a. But then I had work experience at a hospital, and that blew my mind. I was like, wow, being in a hospital, you do so many crazy things where, like, things that you won't get to do if you are just like any other job. So as a medic, right, and I think this is this is the thing that makes you medicine so unique compared to other degrees is when I meet you, let's say you're my patient, right? when I meet you as a person, I don't see a fake version of you. I see you as a person, as an individual. When I take a history from you uh, to get to know about your health condition, I don't just care about your health condition. I care about you as a as a whole. I care about your social history, but I care about how, who do you live with or what. And that person ability, you won't get much in other professions. Yeah, you can get it here and there but in a certain profession, maybe in law, when they're really grilling on someone or really want to know that, trying to like do pro bono work. Yeah, they do have that kind of thing. But in medicine, every in every aspect of medicine you do, you get to see a person for who they truly are. And during quarantine, that really shone through. Yeah. Because yeah. on quarantine, um, all I get to see was like on, you know, you're just on Instagram or on Twitter and you see all this fakeness. Like it was just like, this isn't real people. This is not what I'm used to. And I was very fortunate. I was a medical student. So I was like, OK, I can go work in the hospitals. So and during my work, then I was like, oh, this is such a relief. This is a human being. These are real people, like real flaws. And I love that about it because it makes it makes you feel OK. It's like, do you know, what? I'm flawed. These, everyone's flawed and everyone's flawed in their own way. And that's OK. And I think that's so beautiful that medicine, we can cultivate that and help people through that, all of that. And one of the things that I would say, you know, if ever if asked you why medicine, don't ever say like, oh, it's just to help people out. Because, yes, you can help people out. But there is more to medicine than just helping people out. I think there is more intimacy behind medicine, really helping someone out, genuinely to the core, um, to make them better. No, yeah, and that's, that's, a very, that's a very good answer in that medicine almost eliminates all the, the ego out of the patient and... Mm -hmm. Yes, you have these egotistical Instagrammers that publish these fake photos, but at the end of the day, e even for myself, from me relating back to my work experience, having worked in a hospital, everybody's going to be treated the same as a patient. Given the vaccines, everybody gets the same jab in the round. There's no, there's no hierarchy anymore with being a patient, and I think the way you just portrayed that was was excellent. In that you're a doctor and you're going to see the patient, not what they're career is not what they're like outside how famous they are how much money they have at the end of the day it boils down to they're a human and, and they have flaws as you said and that was that was almost a perfect answer so thank you for that mm. so i guess you, you mentioned briefly with your work experience but what work experience did you particularly undertake uh, to i guess aid in your application? oh i did a lot uh like i didn't do what see what I my plan was this I was like okay I need to figure out is medicine actually for me and I would say anyone who is applying to medicine tell yourself apart from medicine if medicine wasn't the thing what else would you want to do because the last thing you want to do is go into medicine and you're like actually I wanted to do this and um, because you can drop out of medicine that is true but I don't think that's a good thing because you wasted uh, it's not waste but it feels like you could have given that position to someone else who truly wanted to want to have done it. But then they, you can't do anything about that. People change their mind and they have the right to do so. But doing that due diligence beforehand is so important. So for me, I was like, okay, I want to do medicine, but let me explore other things. What other things am I kind of interested in? So I was interested in sort of maths, bioengineering, and all of this other stuff. So I looked into that. So I was like, math. I was like, yeah, math is really cool. Math is really fun. But the, what you get to do out of it, it just didn't seem like something I could do long term. Um, and I was good at maths, but I don't think I was exceptional at maths. And I think you really have to be quite exceptional to do a lot of the things that you want to do. Um, but you can do maths uh, as a hobby, even if you wanted to, like solving interesting problems. So I was like, fine, that's a bit of maths. 
Now they said chemistry. And I was like, actually, chemistry is quite interesting. We get to uh, make new drugs and all of that. And I did some work experience in chemistry. So I did. So I went to Imperial, worked with some chemists there. I did love my experience there, but I was like, this doesn't feel like something I want to do forever and for my life. And then I went, okay, fine. Let's let's say chemistry. I would love to do at university, but long term as a job, I just couldn't see myself. So I was like, why would I go to university? And then it wouldn't be use, useful. So that was chemistry then. So then I was like, okay, let's see if I really do want to do medicine. So I did volunteering. Uh, I used to volunteer for a hospital for around two years. I, I worked with the elderly and I worked with the children there. I absolutely fell in love with ward work at that time. I was like, especially in the pediatric ward, I was like, this was like where I belong. And I felt that. And the beautiful thing is when, when you're in work experiences, it depends on where you are. But if you have a nice consultant, they will really show you around and you can either take the histories and the, how they're working things out. And it just shows that with medicine, the, the, the beautiful thing that really, really enticed me, especially as I did my work experience, was every knowledge that they had was in use. So they didn't waste their degree, if that makes sense. For example, it's not to say that like biochemistry, you waste a degree, but the knowledge you learn, for example, in biochemistry or uh, physics or maths, when it comes to the work environment, you don't tend to use it. You use the skills behind it, the critical thinking, the problem solving, all of that stuff definitely use. But the actual maths or the actual physics, you don't tend to use unless you go into that specific academia field. Whereas medicine, all the things you learn will always be then something that is always vital and always something that you can use uh, to your advantage. I think that's something really that was like, wow, that seems like a very worth a degree for me. Um, so that's one of the big reasons, like oh, that, that, those are the, all that like, the stuff, the work experience. Um, other things I did were, so I worked, uh, so did a bit of lab work, a bit of hospital work and a bit of uh, volunteering. I did uh, NCS as well, uh, okay. which is yeah. the National Citizen Social Service at the time. So I think that's for year 11 and 12. Um, that was eye-opening to me because although that wasn't related to medicine or anything, that that experience was the first time I had experience speaking to people of wide variety of places, of abilities, etc. And I think that was quite nice to see, you know, being in an environment where you can be with that sort of thing. And medicine allows for that. Medicine, you know, although you're as a doctor might be with people who are very intelligent things, but you're working with individuals who are various different abilities. And I think that's quite nice. Yeah, for sure. And you, you mentioned a real good point in that. I, I guess it's not just medicine, but a healthcare, that healthcare professional as a whole in that nobody wants anybody to be a bad doctor. Nobody wants anybody to be a bad biomedical scientist. And I guess that's very true just to the healthcare system in the UK. So you, you don't really care if there's bad mathematicians <laughs> as long yeah, as they're yeah. not teaching your children. But I, I guess that does stay true to the whole the healthcare system and it's a really good plan that you made so with, with your application then did you just sit the UK you said you applied for Oxford so was it the B? So, yeah I, I applied for both the U so I, I had to apply strategically I was thinking okay what's going to give me the best chances so my UCAT was had a decent score but it wasn't like a high score so it was like yeah I got a, a decent score but it wasn't like oh, over 700 or anything but it was good enough for certain universities, but not good enough for the science. So I was like, okay, I need to apply strategically. Things like Sheffield wasn't going to be a good bet because those are more UK heavy. So I had to do it was like, actually, you know, it's better for me to apply for the BMAT as well. And the BMAT exams were much easier for me to do because I felt it was more like I practiced a lot with the BMAT and I felt a lot more comfortable with the BMAT because it was more preparable. Whereas UCAT yeah. was a lot more um it's a lot more regimen like it, it's a bit weirder in terms of there was no real way i knew at that time how to prepare yeah. but now like uh, as i'm doing uk tuition and like working with different companies um there are like different ways that these companies like teach you how to do your uk i'm like oh wow i didn't even know that when i was doing it um but there is a system to it there is a way you can try to get better marks of course 
um, but not everyone can afford that. So I didn't. I I only did the practice. But I would say, you know, if you are going to do the UCAT or the BMAT, you know, if you can get someone to just give you some guidance or do you know, one or two or three hours of tuition, just so you can have some guidance as to whereabouts you take the lessons or how you go about structuring out your revision. Because sometimes the tuition is not about how to do it, because that that can be quite expensive to take someone else's time. But sometimes it's just saying, actually, focus on this, do this instead of this. Those are the sort of things. And I think you can, the biggest thing with all of those is like practice, 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 but you need to know the techniques behind it as well. So there is practice. For example, one of the techniques I'll say is in the BMAT, uh, some books tell you the technique of uh, for conclusion based questions to read the statements on the passages uh, on the options and then read the passage but actually doing it the other way around it is genuinely better for the bmat uh, i've realized so because when you read the options you trick your mind to think something is there when it's not so you always that's why it's always better to read for example what the passage says and then the so these little tricks where you start to learn I think is worth for someone who I would say looking back is if you can get two or three hours of tuition just so you can have an idea of these different little techniques that you can use. Yeah and I, again that's a really good point in it, it's learning the, the structure behind the exam and how the exams are, are marked at the end of the day especially with the UCAT now with especially graduate entry where they're asking for like 2,700 up just to mm -hmm. get an interview it's it's so competitive and knowing knowing those little tips and tricks will save you those two or three seconds per question and it doesn't sound a lot but when when it comes down to the well the finish line that that might be the difference between you getting that interview or being rejected at the end of the day so that's really good yeah so with your with your free offer uh, with your free interviews were they both uh, MLIs at the time, or did you have any panel interviews? So, as well? I, I, so I had four, interviews. Oh, four interviews. Sorry. So for my four interviews, uh, two were MMIs and two were panels. So the traditional, so the Oxford and UCL are both panel based, and Birmingham and Bristol were both MMI based. So um, the MMI based ones I found were the the nice thing with the MMI ones is this is if you mess up a station, it doesn't matter because you can just move on to the next one and it's a fresh station. The panel ones, if you mess up there, you kind of messed up because it's like, you, there's, no, there's no way you can, you, you just have to like please them there and then. Um, so I think that's the thing with panel interviews, uh, which I think they're moving away. UCL has stopped doing panel interviews. They're moving on to MMYs now. Oxford, I think, still do uh, panel interviews because they're old and they, they don't want to think. But yeah, it is what it is. Um, but I think MMI is definitely the way to go because it definitely stops a lot of discrimination from happening and allows you to do as well as you can in different stations, even if you mess up one or two. Yeah, and I guess the the aspect with MMIs as well is they can test different different parts of your your abilities and your knowledge. Yes. <laughs> The big part is role play within MMI. Some universities are very heavy on role play. And I guess, did you get any role plays at the time? And do you yes, have so uh, Bristol unusually didn't have a role play, but Birmingham did. Um, usually the role play stations and stuff are fairly similar. Yeah. So there'll be either a Breaking Bad News station or it will be talking to someone about something. So it's usually something along those lines. Um, but the best way you can practice is people say it's best to practice with someone like, you know, et cetera. But I would, I would, after doing a lot of tuition, I would disagree now because I was thinking it's just sometimes you, I would say get a medical student or a dentist student who's done an MMI student, a station before, just message them to say, look, I'm really worried. I've got my interview soon. Can you give me like 15 minutes of time to go to some role play or whatever? Now, most meds, a lot of med students uh, would be, if you ask them nicely, they would be like, yeah, sure, that, that's fine, 15 minutes is all right. But if you go in like and asking for like an hour or two hours of your time, then it might be pushing it sometimes because it's like, um, it depends on them at the end of the day, but sometimes it could be pushing it because they have, they're quite busy. 
15 minutes is reasonable, like you can go through it quickly. But if you're going for an hour or two hours, then they might all do it as a paid thing, etc. Because it does take up quite a bit of the time because they could be doing other things. Um, so I would say message someone who's done that interview before, just so you can have a practice as to what role play really is like. So I put some videos on my YouTube channel as well. Um, if you just search up Medifectious, um, there are two videos there where one is a role play scenario where I was acting and then I gave feedback to the person who was interviewing as well. So you can see what it's like and how it will actually be like rather than some of the stuff they've, some of the ones they do, they're not harsh enough, I feel, in the role play that they do. They're just sort of like kind of there. But yeah. And I would say there are a lot of like smaller companies out there now who do, they, like, that are like charity based companies that do MMI practice OSCE station for like 10, 20 pounds. They're definitely worth it because I've been to those and they're a lot more like the actual OSCEs and they will definitely help you out. Yeah, um, I guess that's that, that's the, the, the one side to it, but the other side would be the preparation behind it. And going back to when you said breaking bad news, would you think it would be beneficial to learn? I guess, the procedure on how to break bad news and then you can apply that to almost anything. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, you can do that. But the, the thing is, these stations aren't... You, so you, will, you can learn the models. For example, for breaking bad news, the model is what we call the spikes model. But that's only one type of model. So um, that's something you learn even at med school about breaking bad news. But it's not something what I would say is you 100% need to learn for your breaking bad news. What I would say is you need to practice it with someone and say, someone has to just say, you just need to make the mistake. Because when you once you made the mistake, you can be like, actually, that wasn't the right way to do it. You should do this. And then you, that's going to stick you to your head. So when you practice again, you're going to be a lot better at it. When you're just learning, learning, learning all of these things, it, as good as it gets, it's unless you're practicing there and then, it, you won't be able to know what to do when you're in the brunt of the situation. Yeah, for sure. And it's almost not coming off sounding robotic at that point. If you just exactly. learned all of the procedures, then yeah. you're just reading out of a textbook. And at the end of the day, yeah. they don't want you to do that. They want to see who you are. You're not going to be asked to read out of a textbook and memorize all yeah. that. And one thing I would say is, like, I've been an examiner as well from inter or interviews. Um, and I can, so when you come in to the thing, I can tell from my side, you're, um, you're not being genuine or you're making it up. It's very obvious when someone is being genuine and someone not being genuine. Or yeah. when, yeah. for example, the big thing is empathy. So a lot of people fail to show that empathy. I know that sounds weird, but you'll find a lot of med students, the issue with empathy is the fact that they're very clever, but when it comes to empathy, uh, people skills, they don't tend to shine off on that. So you might see a lot of articles about these students doing, oh, they got A stars and all of that, and but they fail all the interviews, they got no offers, how come? But actually, it's not because they're dumb, it's because they might not have that appropriate people skills, which they could demonstrate in the interviews, which is really, really important. Yeah, and it's finding that fine balance on how you can actually have those, well, I guess gain those people skills, because it's something that's not, for, for the mass of people, it's something that's not naturally there mm. you have to gain that by either working exactly. or doing volunteer experience and it's almost exactly. having that fine balance between your academic excellence and your i guess your community having having that rapport with people yeah, being exactly. able to build it quickly which is i yeah. guess essential for that mm. mmi station at the end of the day yeah yeah so i guess to to move on to the the nitty-gritty about med school what is there any particular myths or misconceptions that I guess you were thought were stigmatised within med school before you got there? Okay, one thing I would say, it's not a myth, but I think it's a truth. Rather, I thought it was a myth at the time. Okay. But a lot of people already knew that it was, it, it's not the case. So I used to think in, when you go to med school, there are going to be a wide range of individuals from a lot of different backgrounds and widening participation and all of that because there's all of this talk about widening participation. But you go to med school and then a lot of individuals are actually quite affluent 
or yeah. are quite um they're quite well off in some ways they they're from good environments i'm not saying all of them are because i know individuals who aren't but there is a bigger portion who are from good backgrounds who have um who have had a good education and all of that so and i was a little bit surprised and i felt a little bit lonely because i just felt i didn't know how to speak to them because i grew up in an environment where what we would call you know it was full of gangs and it was you know southeast london and it was just that's the sort of environment i grew up in and a lot of people didn't understand that and it was very difficult for example to make jokes and a lot of things was they it was something that they couldn't understand because it was like the type of person you accumulate in the environment that you've been is reflective of like the environment you grew up and sometimes you can't when you entered med when i entered med school i was like why can't i find anyone that's like me why is everyone like this very cookie cutter type of you know you could tell like there's a there's a certain t- type of student that's a med student and i don't think this is a med school fault like it's not med school that's the problem um it's more of a societal thing and but i think this is slowly changing with the introduction of a lot more winding participation programs and a lot more university getting involved in those things because at the end of the day you can't just lower your standards for being a doctor you still need a person that is empathetic but is also academically able because the degree itself i wouldn't say is hard but it does require a lot from you in terms of time and effort and you really want need to know that you want to do it i think a lot of things people think that oh medicine is the hardest degree when actually it people trick themselves into thinking it's hard when in reality the reason it's hard is because there is just so much to learn but at the same time you have to realize there isn't as as well it, it seems odd but although there is a lot to learn there isn't a lot that you need to learn so there will be a lot of content but actually what's tested is very very little so you have to sort of think well there's a lot of content but i'm not going to need to learn all of that i actually need to know all of this but well, people are, are so focused on learning all everything that that's what then gets them stressed and then you see them like getting all stressed and overworked um and for example when you're going through the exams you realize actually the exams aren't hard but it's the fact that you have to keep that knowledge in your head even the simple things you have to keep those knowledge in your head and having a good approach so what you learn as you go through medicine is you build your systems so that if you don't know something can i use my system as a back backup to find a, a, a way to get there yeah for sure and i guess looking back to your your first answer about um, i guess the competitiveness of med school how have you found it adjusting to so the undergraduate is going to be totally different to what graduate entry is like within i guess like the knowledge base and the the skill set but yeah so i think when you when i first entered yes you were, um, i would say the competition isn't as fierce as it is in certain other unions so i think manchester birmingham usually unions up north although competition is a thing um students aren't like stabbing you in the back competition kind of thing where i'm going to try to be better than you uh, and you know because i need to get the top d sal or whatever because that in reality that doesn't mean much in the large scheme of things but it does mean some things more to some people and i would say you know for me you know d sal is quite important because i want to go back to london and it's one of the competitive areas unfortunately and i wish it wasn't there because that i think being competitive brings a lot of toxic traits yeah. um yeah. where people you would see in a lot of med students uh, in a lot of med- medical schools where people won't share notes people would sabotage notes to make sure that other person fails and all of those things and it's a horrible horrible thing to see and i think it's a lot more prevalent in london unis uh, than other unis because, and it does happen in other unis but i think it's a lot more prevalent in london unis because london they uh 
unis, they just have this very toxic environment of competition, which isn't good. Um, and you, you're, you're forced to try to be better than someone else. And it's sort of ingrained into you since the early years. Whereas in some place like Birmingham, uh, and I, I've spoken to other people, maybe even in Manchester and in Liverpool, they, they, they talk about Disa like, it's not that important. They just try to put it on the backside. It is important, like 100% it's important, but they just sort of put it to the side and said, look, don't be this competitive. Don't think of this. It's something that is there. Try to do your best. And that's, that's what like, Birmingham starts is. Whereas other places, they might be like, you know, these are important. You need to try to be at the top. And I think that leads to a lot of burnout and a lot of suicides in some people as well, yeah. which is really serious yeah. matter. And mental health is, is, is really bad in med students for that reason. Yeah, for sure. And I guess that comes down to just the competitive nature of how competitive it is in the first place to get into these London mm. unis. And yeah. if that be yes, you had the support in the background, we, as we mentioned earlier, uh, if you didn't, uh, that competitive nation needs to be there for you to mm. get in. Otherwise, like, you wouldn't be there because there's hundreds of people behind you who won that place. So exactly. I, I guess, is that just the, the, the carry-on uh, into your degree? I don't know. I wouldn't say it's the carry-on to the degree. I think if people are competitive, but if the curriculum was designed in a way that you didn't have to compete for anything because there is the only reason it, that people are becoming so competitive is because of what's to come. So they know that, oh, this person has to be in the top decile. This, this whole deciling system that was introduced where if you're the top, you get these mile points and it allows you to get choice as to where you want to go in terms of location. If that wasn't there, I feel like, yes, there'll be competition, but they'll be competing for what? There's nothing to compete for everyone just needs to pass for example so i think yes competition is healthy in terms of it makes you better as doctors and you're improving but it's unhealthy in the fact that it can cause other people to that mental health issue it gets worse and worse um so i think it's a balance and i think right now the way it's structured it it can be quite detrimental to some people and we're really not to a normal undergraduate, a normal undergraduate, say, for myself, studying biomed. Personally, everybody wants to be hitting those 70 or above because at the end of the day, most, as a blanket statement, most biomed students go on to study graduate entry medicine or medicine. It's almost a gateway onto that pathway. And with that, it's, it's almost, again, as you said, the competitive nature is there and sometimes it does get very toxic and I don't know I don't know why it comes from the the medicine side obviously with graduate uh, sorry with biomed you need to be hitting those 70s above to even have a chance on getting onto medicine course but with medicine you just need to hit those pass marks and ultimately you'll become a doctor yeah, the, yeah exactly so ultimately that is true so as long as you pass you do end up becoming a doctor and I think that's true, but the the way it's the system is made is yes, you will become a doctor, but I think you just won't have that choice in in foundation, and a lot of people want to move and they don't get that. But the in the grand scheme of thing, I would say medicine is easier than biomed in some or other degrees in the fact that as long as you've passed, you've got a degree, you'll be a doctor. Whereas with biomedicine, let's say you failed your degree is now useless kind of thing because it's which is kind of sad because there are going to be people that fail and they maybe get uh, or they've just passed but just passing a biomed degree might not open as many doors as getting let's say a two one or a first for sure and that that that's a big thing on when you look at the statistics and five percent of people are sorry five percent of people get a two two some of them fail and I think it's like 60, get a 2-1. You've got to realise you're facing against another 80% that have got first and a 2-1. So if you're in that 2-2 two -two bracket, your degree, I don't like to say useless, but when you're competing for these already competitive jobs, if that be in a lab or graduate entry medicine, it's, it, it almost does become so much harder for you, which I think medicine is 
is very unique in that aspect. Mm, yes, I, I, I would agree 100%, yes. So, I guess, going into you personally, what, what keeps you motivated in such an intense course like medicine? I guess especially what, sorry, in what was, what, Just what keeps you motivated in such an intense course like medicine? I think nothing really, like, I think motivation is a thing where I, I really like the way um, Ali Abdal put it, yeah. where he motivation isn't something that, you know, people think that it needs to come up from you and then you think, oh, I'm, I'm motivated now and I need to do it. And I think that's a lie and I agree with Ali Abdal and I think there's a lot of studies to show that because um, when there are times where you feel perked up again, I feel good, I'm ready to revise. And you go into that session, you did 10 minutes, and there was like that, that motivation has gone. It did. There was nothing there. Whereas, med I think any degree, it's, you, it's not motivation that you need. It's, it's uh, uh, I like this analogy, what one of the YouTubers put it, it wasn't Ali Abdal. You can think of a bridge, okay? So this is your bridge. And you're trying to get from one building to the other. If the bridge is there, you'll take as much time as you want to get from that bridge to the other. Right? You you can sit there on the bridge if you want. There's nothing really move, motivating you to get from one bridge to the other. But let's now set, change the situation. Let's say that the place you were at is now burning down. You're going to run as fast as you can to get to the other building because that place is burning down. That bridge is going to burn it down. And the best motivation is your deadlines because, or having deadlines for yourself. Or, and this is why whenever you do research, for example, um, a lot of researchers will say, no, you need to go and stick by a deadline. Go and find a conference or something that you can post to so that you have some sort of deadline to work towards. Because if you don't, you're just going to be all the way like wandering because you're like, you don't have anything you're working towards or an end point. Does that make sense? So, yeah. I think that's what the important thing is having something that is punishing you that if you don't do it, it's going to like there's there's consequences for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. that's going to be your motivation. And um, people you, you can use positive conditioning if you want. Like, for example, you can use chocolate biscuits or whatever to help you revise. Some people do that. Um, but you do still need that push from the back where. I need to get it done because if I don't, there are consequences. No, yeah, I totally agree. And the the way Ali explains it is it, it's very insightful in that. I, I think he explains it in it, it's more enjoyment that you actually get out of the subject. You shouldn't need motivation to do something you you dislike. You should you, you should have more. Uh, you, your motivation is the enjoyment that you actually get out of it. And I think mm. as a good example, every time I speak to somebody. Uh, on the other end of the screen, it it does motivate me into if that be getting my assignments in or getting my um, I guess getting my application started, getting my UCAT revision started, and I think the motivation comes from the enjoyment of speaking to you and seeing what what's ahead in the future. And I guess that's a positive conditioning as well yeah. as seeing. And I think the that. other thing to I guess to add to that is just me remembering is some days you are in a slog and you're just like i don't want to do anything what's the point of life and then you just you're just like well what's the point of anything you just you can't think of it like you just feel like a slog and that's everyone goes through that sort of slog and it's not uh, and it might be because you're tired because you've done so much work already so one of the things i would uh, i would say anyone does is just get up and walk out like get your clothes ready and just walk outside and do something outside your room because when you're in your room you're you're all congested it just doesn't like you can't do anything but when you walk outside you have that fresh air you have time to think and just doing nothing can motivate you because you're doing nothing you're just letting your body just renew itself to think I don't need it. like today I, I didn't you know my exam just one of my exams were done yesterday so I was like just gonna do nothing today. I've got exams in two weeks. On well, today, I'm just gonna do nothing. Just you know, muck about and you know, just take renew myself from anything. 
And the other thing I would say is change your. There was there's a book. Uh, everyone there's all these productivity, and I read it. It was a. Uh, uh, Okay, I forgot Atomic Habits. Atomic Habits, really, really good book. Uh, I'd recommend anyone to read it. And one of the the points that they made, and I agree with this point a lot because it's something I implemented without realizing, is your environment dictates how well you would want to do things. So, for example, me in my room, I have no one to tell me what to do because there's no one here. And if I muck around, if I play games, if I I don't know, I'm dancing around, whatever. No one's going to stop me. But if I go to the library, there are people working around me. I can do. I should do my work because what else should I be doing? Like this is my environment to work. So for me, I, I realized more and more as I got older, is working at home is atrocious. It's just not for me, and I need to work at the library because. And I, you know, I don't know how I did it during A levels. Uh, and looking back, it was not a good thing. But go sometimes having that breakage thing. Home is to relax and just do whatever the flip you want. And when you go to the library, you just get your work done as much as you can. And I think that is so good. Like obviously, you still might procrastinate in the library, but there's a lot less likely to because someone might come around like, "What are you doing?" And just might watch some weird YouTube video. Like, okay, actually, what am I doing? Um, so that sort of thing kind of keeps you motivated just to just get your work done. And when you're done from the library, you come home, you can be at least content that I've done some work today at least, and you can be happy about that. Um, the other thing you can do is um, having a, uh, which I did try to do for a bit, but I didn't personally find it that useful. What some people do is just sometimes writing out what happened that day and saying, you know, today I got this done, I got this done. Actually, you know, I got quite a bit done today and uh, I feel proud. Um, that can be quite useful. Um, so. A lot of people use that. I did do it for a bit, but I didn't find it extremely useful for me. But some people might find that useful. Yeah, for sure. And I guess we, we kind of answered my uh, my next question. But just how do you how do you find time? And I guess how do you structure for I guess rest and self care within your degree? I think this one I still struggle with. Um, you know, I think there's been, I think this is one thing that a lot of medical students and even myself, I, because I'm not, I don't feel like I'm the most organized person in the world. Um, and when I do try to organize my life in terms of oh, scheduling and stuff, it doesn't work for me. It's just, it, it just hinders me and then just like, I can't stick to this schedule. I'm very, it's, it, I don't really like to be like stuck to something and then like, like that sort of schedule. But where so you have to you have to sort of see around what you want to do. And I always like what I have tried to force myself doing is having um in my calendar some sort of event that I'm looking forward to. So whether it be a society event or um going out to eat with my friends saying, Do you know what? Do you wanna go out to eat this weekend? It's like, yeah, let's do it for an hour or two. And then you can do it. And I think that's just something you can look forward to. Um, rest in itself is probably most of the time is sleep because other times you're probably working or doing other things. Um, you're always doing something. And I, and I think it is something that I f f fully struggle with. But it's something where I've managed by knowing that when I feel like I am tiring out. I cannot do, like, my mind can just cannot take any more. I'll just stop. And recognizing that is actually really important. I didn't recognize that in first year, and I burnt out in first year. I can't believe it. My first year, I had a degree, and I already burnt out. And then I, and I didn't understand why. Like, I, was, I, I did horribly in my exam, and I was just like, what happened to me? I, I worked so hard. Like, what happened? And it wasn't because I, I worked so hard. It was because it was because I worked so hard. It, you burn out and that is going to make your grades a lot worse because you're not thinking about it. You're not being strategic or you're not stopping yourself when you've done too much. Um, and also listen to other people. If someone is telling you, careful, you, you might burn out. You need to reflect on yourself. It's like, ah, actually, you're right. I might burn out. I need to do a bit more fun things in my life and do other things. 
and when the, w- one thing I realize a lot more about life is is you got to wh- whatever you're doing, where every part of your life is, you're not gonna ever get this youth again. You're not gonna get this time again to do what you're gonna do. So, for example, I really wanted to go skydiving, and this year I definitely will. Like, you know, COVID happened, but I really wanted to do it last year. And I'm like, look, I just need to get it out done with because I'm not gonna wait until something happens for me to do stuff. And another thing you start to realize is sometimes you don't need other people to enjoy your time. For me, is like sometimes I would go to the cinema on, or, alone and just be like, yeah, I'm, I enjoy the cinema on my own. It's fine because sometimes you don't, you might not get someone else, and you can't always rely on other people to come with you because everyone has such hectic schedules. And being okay about being alone and doing fun activities is also appropriate as well. Um, and I think getting used to that is quite. Uh, quite useful as well yeah yeah for sure and it's it's that saying of run your life around medicine not like medicine run your life and it's yeah. such I, I guess it's the same with any degree but being able to study this this subject where you can go as deep as you want especially with medicine because you're learning breadth not depth yeah you see you're touching the top of the pond and yes you can go as deep as you want but yeah being able to that you're sacrificing your time outside medicine and it's it, as you said you explained it excellently is that you, this is a degree for life you're you're in it for four or five years and it's going to be a career for the rest of your life so don't 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 sacrifice all of your time you you've got your lifetime to learn medicine you don't need to mm-hmm. learn it in these four or five years yes you pass your exams but experience comes with time enjoy yourself while you're youthful exactly exactly and i think that's quite i think with medicine it's quite difficult um in the fact that it, when you are in uh during your a levels or whatever you have a specific and i think this is the thing i wish they'd had is like you have a specification and whatever is in that specification will come up whereas in in medicine sometimes they have things in the specification or things that have come up before and then something weird and wonderful comes up and you're like, where did this come from? I didn't see this coming. And that's, that gets a little bit annoying sometimes where you don't expect things, certain things in exams and they come up. And I wish they didn't do that because I think that kind of puts people off because they're revising what they've told taught us and then they start putting things which are a little bit unusual. Um, so I think having a little bit more commonality in terms of the questions would would be a good thing for sure for sure so what does a week look like uh i guess birmingham med school then see pre-covid is probably totally different yeah pre-covid so it's different between pre-clinical and clinical so pre-clinical your see i this was so it just became so so normal but i realized other uni other places it's not like this not like other other uh, sorry other degrees. So most degrees in medicine is like this. So you, you start your lectures from like nine and your ne- lectures from nine up until five or six. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday and Friday. Wednesday you get half day, which is nice. Um, but pretty much every other day you're getting like every day you're getting ninety five lectures. Um, so there's a lot of lot lectures. Um, but one thing I'll say is when people say there's ninety five lectures, it doesn't mean there is a lecture, like back to back. So it means that there are lectures, maybe, let's say there's a lecture nine to 10, and then maybe there's an hour break, and there's a lecture 11 to 12, and then maybe after that, there might be back to back lectures, three lectures. So there will be like maybe five lectures or six lectures in a day, but it's spread out between nine to five, um, which makes, uh, but the nice convenient thing now with medicine and just the future of technology is you can get recorded lectures, which makes the life a lot more flexible and a lot easier and it helped me a lot because i fell asleep half the time when i was lectures i was just like what is it? i just couldn't i just couldn't like after like maybe 30 minutes i would knock out like i would get in there 10 minutes in i'd go to sleep and then i wake up like half an hour before the like like 20 minutes later and then i'm wide awake and i list the last 30 minutes of the lecture but i could not stay awake for the full hour of that lecture um, but when I'm re- when it's a recorded lecture, that's fine. I can watch the whole thing and I'm okay. But when it's it's just different people learn different ways, and yeah. you need to find your yeah. way. And 
So I felt really bad. I think in first year, I was like, oh, no, 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 I need to go to every single lecture. Like, this, this, I need to do this. Like, I can't be a bad student. Like, I need to do it. Um, because you're in that mentality that you, to be a good student, you have to be in every lecture. You technically do, but um, it's better for me to just see that recorded lecture and then learn it from there. And that's what helped me. But it's not helpful for everyone. So you need to find what works for you. That's, that's a really good point. And I, I can reflect on that myself with this year's almost been a dream with being able to just start and stop recordings whenever you want and having to travel all the way to Manchester every day to sit there and have the lectures say, you need to turn up to every lecture or it's statistically proven that 70% of people that don't turn up get a lesser grade. And it's like, well... It did work for the first year, but the amount of knowledge you actually retain within that lecture. Again, COVID has been amazing for some people. As you said, with uh, recorded lectures, some people like to make these handwritten notes and it's just almost abolished all of their known revision uh, techniques. But yeah, it's a really good point to make that. I guess with medicine, you don't need to know all the content. As you said, you just need to know it, would you say you just need to know the main bits, like the the, the skim of so the? Uh, it's it's like, it's a bit unusual. So it's like, for example, in your exam, they can here's all the content, but in the exam they will test you on different parts of that content to see that you've learned all the content. So you don't really know what's going to really come up. But there's certain things that what we call in medicine they bang on, especially in the US, like US, and we in the UK is do a similar thing is high yield topics where which are high yield questions what questions are more likely to come up um rather than learning everything because you can't learn everything so you try to um there's another youtuber called anna snow who takes this thing where you learn the central yeah. central components first and then you look at the peripheries and i think that's a good way to say how you should learn medicine like learn the core stuff learn the stuff they the days that you should learn and then learn the other things to get the higher mark so you need to get that core thing rather than going in that chronological order, which we call it. Sure, for sure. So what's your vision going into the future then? So you're, you're coming up on your, your final years. So. so I would say, well, because I'm intercalating in infectious diseases next year, I think I would want to do a lot more. Uh, I think it would be nice to just do as much research as possible in that year because I won't have any clinical commitments. It's just maybe lectures and I would have a lot more uh tool sets for research because i'll understand things like regression and all of that stuff a bit more it's a difficult like i really did try to learn all of these things about r coding and stuff during medicine but it's very hard to like, give, give that time because you still need to prioritize your clinical studies and things and um and i do love uh, uh clinical work and i think i i definitely wouldn't move away from clinical work i'd still do it um but I think long term, uh, I'm not really sure exactly where I'd want to go, but I know I want to work in hospitals. For now, that, that's pretty, like, you know, I'm pretty set that I want to work in a hospital or in some capacity. Um, and I want to do something maybe, I've always leaned towards pediatrics for a long time, um, but I would see after my actual final year when we do actual pediatrics to see how it's like. Is it as good as it say, they say it is, or is it horrible? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll find out. Um, but I really like infectious diseases, and I really like anaesthetics as well. So that could be something I move into. So, um, because I'm always in the emergency department. Like, you'll see me half the time I'm in the emergency department. I don't even go to the wards, because in the emergency department, you just get to see so many cool things. Um, and you get to do so many cool things, which, uh, as a med student, which you can't do in other wards, uh, unfortunately. So... We'll see. I think emergency, emergency med or infectious diseases or pediatrics, those are the sort of things that I'm leaning towards. Sure. So for future medical students watching this video, are there any golden pieces of advice you give somebody going through the application process to start? Okay, let's let me break down the advice for different parts. So firstly, when it comes to your exam, uh, so uh, if you are uh, not a, get, uh, um, a graduate entry, let's say you're a year 11, you're 12 watching this, then I would say you need, uh, you need to focus on making sure that you have the right plan to do well in your exams. And say, I'd also tell myself, looking back, is don't take too much on. 
be strategic about what you take on. Because I did a lot of things before like going into medical, but actually you didn't need to. For example, I took five A-levels, which is not necessary. Instead, I should have just taken three. So th those things where don't put too much effort on yourself because it's not going to actually value. It's not going to add any value. It's just going to add stress for no reason. So if you're going to do something, do it because it actually adds value and think about it. Is it actually going, when you look at the specification of what they want at university, does it actually help you? I would say invest some money if you have the funds into a, a, a good tutor and but you don't don't try to get a lot of hours because a lot of these companies make you end up buying 20 30 40 50 hours and i'm like a lot of people don't need that what you do need to, is a few hours sometimes with tutors um and you can sometimes get them for free like a lot of people as i said can are willing to tutor you for free um, if you're nice enough um go on instagram find people and if or sometimes people do it for a lot cheaper than a lot of the bigger companies try and find these people and get a few hours of them i'd say probably around five hours is more than enough just to get you that grasp of what you need if you need more hours you can get it with them but don't try to think that don't use your tutor as a clutch for example you need to do your own work but you need that tutor i, I feel like a lot of people should get that tutor or mentoring as wherever, wherever you find it get it just so you can do that for the long term and there's a lot of free resources out there. There is another medic called Nushi Medic. Um, she does. She she has given like she has a post of all these free resources you can get. Um, uh, so try and find out all these free resources before you pay for anything. You can use those all, all up. So, and for exams, make sure you practice other things apart from like that is similar to that resources first. So for example, if you're planning for the BMAT. Use the TSA papers, those are the thinking skills assessment papers and the IMAP papers first, and then do the BMAP. So you have the BMAP resources there for you when you get in there close to the actual exam. And don't try to, you can do the exam in two chunks, but don't go in too intense into the exam uh, or like UK exam too early. Uh, I would say if you're going to do some practice beforehand, do a little bit every week, that's fine. But don't yeah. try to do a lot like every single week trying to think, oh, I'm going to do so much because you're going to peak and then you're just going to start to get falter because you're going to get complacent thinking, oh, I'm really doing so well. And then you're going to do a lot worse. So make sure you do those intensely at the end. The, in terms of the interview, um, what I, I, I would say is make sure uh, you try to go to those free events that a lot of, you know, there's, there's on Instagram, it's on uh, Facebook, whatever. If there's free events for where like med student, medical doctors and things are helping you out, even Royal College of, uh, of uh, Surgeons or, or Medicine, they usually have these like free interview classes and stuff. Go to them, get a feel for them. But I would say only go to one or two. Don't try to go to all of them because they all say the same thing basically. But if there's some that are offering free uh, MMI interview like mocks, go to those. Don't go to the ones that MMI tutorials, they literally say the same thing again and again. Just go to the mocks because that's what you need. You need to get that practice. And there are probably tons out there for free or some that are out there for quite cheap. And you should go out and get those. Yeah, for sure. And finally, for someone starting out their first day at Birmingham Med School, what would be your take on tips for that student? So I would say is make sure you make friends with older years because they will give you resources that you will definitely need um, for the long run. They, if you do not make friends with older years, you are literally shooting yourself in the foot. I realized that in first year where there are a lot of beautiful resources that older years have that's going to help you out so much. But if you don't have them, you'll shoot yourself in the foot because they, what they do is they sometimes they, they make notes where this is the stuff you need to learn. This other stuff isn't useful. <laughs> this stuff is what you need to learn. And then you're like, oh, okay, that's not actually a lot. But when you try to learn all the medicine, you're like, that's a lot of stuff. When you look at what the older years and what actually comes up in your exams, they will give you that insight. So make friends with older years because that's the best thing you can do. And to be fair, that's for any medic. Um, but that's the thing. The other thing is, uh, get used to the Birmingham. Like, if you're from London, Get used to the Birmingham banter being a let. You need to be, you need to be a little bit more careful with your banter. We're, we're in London, they're a bit more savage, I would say. 
than people in Birmingham sometimes. Uh, people in Birmingham are much nicer people, so try to be, be careful with the banter you use. That's all I would say, because I didn't realise that. Because I came from London and the banter is very dark and morbid <laughs> and savage, uh, and it's very different from when you, when you come to Birmingham, which is a lot of ni- like much more lovely and daisies and roses and all of that. Um, so you have to be very careful uh, in, 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 in sort of that, that sort of thing. And also get involved in societies um, as soon as you can. Like, there's so much fun stuff to do at Birmingham at uh, and uni. Like, like as I said, like Birmingham has a skydiving society. Go to it. Uh, Birmingham has as horse riding, as you know, frisbee, all of these weird and wonderful sports that you know you don't really see anywhere else. Go ahead and do them because you're not going to get time to do them at, at any other time. Uh, first year is the best time to do all the fun stuff. Yeah, for sure. And again. Yeah. I'd just like to say a massive thank you for taking the time over your evening to come speak to me. Yeah. It's, it's a yeah. real pleasure to speak to anybody that could provide some insight. And hopefully this can reach one student and it is done more than enough job at that point. So is there anywhere our viewers can find you online or get in contact with you? Any plugs? Yeah, so if you – so both uh, – so my Instagram is me- – so all of my handles are Medifectious. So if you, my YouTube channel is Manufacturers, my Instagram and my Twitter is Manufacturers as well. Um, and you will see me posting on different topics, uh, weird and wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I, again, massive thank you. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Bye-bye.